Good afternoon, and welcome to today's event, Shakespeare in Politics, an interview with Oscar Eustace, sponsored by Shakespeare America. My name is David McCandless. I'm the Director of Shakespeare Studies at Southern Oregon University here. And my uh, interview with Oscar Eustace is scheduled to go for an hour and a half. At around an hour uh, into the interview, though, we'll, we'll welcome questions from all of you out there who are viewing. Uh, I'll, I'll, at that point, uh, sort of cue you to submit your questions into the chat, and our East Stage Manager, Finley, will read them out at that point. So look forward to that. Well, by way of introduction, uh, let's start with a little game of Jeopardy. The answer is, who was instrumental in developing two of the most monumental transformative theatrical events in American theater history, namely Angels in America and Hamilton? Who is Oscar Eustace? Exactly, yes. Uh, as artistic director of the Eureka Theater in the late 1980s, Oscar commissioned Tony Kushner to write a play about the AIDS epidemic, and thereafter uh, served as a, a resolute dramaturg for the, during the play's period of gestation. More recently, in his current job as artistic director of the Public Theater in New York City, Oscar successfully convinced Hamilton's creator, and Manuel Miranda to turn a work that Miranda insisted was simply a concept album into a groundbreaking, breathtaking musical. So in between these stints as artistic director at the Eureka Theater and leader, leading the public theater in New York City, uh, Oscar also served as uh, artistic director of the Trinity Repertory Company in Providence, Rhode Island, where he held a professorship as professor of theater at Brown University. He's also held professorships at UCLA and Middlebury College and is currently a professor at New York University. Well, since we're here to talk about Shakespeare, fortunately for us, Oscar is also an exuberant Shakespearean scholar and practitioner. At the public, he's continued the proud tradition begun by Joseph Papp of offering free Shakespeare in the park every summer with casts that reflect the rich diversity and cultural eclecticism of the city itself. Also, he's created two new innovative Shakespeare programs in the last decade, the Mobile Unit, which performed Shakespeare's plays at prisons, halfway houses, homeless shelters, and the Public Works, which produces these, these huge Shakespearean performances that bring together a small cohort of professionals, professional actors and musicians, and sometimes literally hundreds of amateur performers drawn from throughout the city. And in fact, in 2018, Oscar himself co-directed a public works production of Twelfth Night, reconfigured as a 90-minute musical with a mostly BIPOC cast. He's also directed Hamlet at the Public in 2008. And in... Uh, 2017, staged a production of Julius Caesar that turned out to be rather controversial. We may have occasion to talk about that. It's a tremendous honor to welcome Oscar Eustace. Thank you so much, David. I'm delighted to be here. So I do think this topic of uh, Shakespeare politics, there are a number of angles, honestly, one could take on it. I thought maybe the most useful way for us to begin might be for you to share the story the greater details of how the, the, the mobile unit and, and the public works evolved into being. I think that would be a good introduction to some of your thoughts about the public um, political utility of Shakespeare. Yeah, I'd be delighted to do that, David. And I agree with you. I think this actually, you, a lot of what the public tries to do with Shakespeare and what we believe our mission is vis-a-vis -vis Shakespeare is revealed by those programs. It, it's first to say that, of course, the mobile unit wasn't completely original. The mobile unit was essentially a reinvention of what Joe Papp began with in 1954. The New York Shakespeare Festival, which became the public theater in the New York Shakespeare Festival, began by performing Shakespeare on the backs of flatbed trucks driven around the city to different venues, different parks, all five boroughs for free. Eventually, the... Um, the legend has it that the truck broke down by the side of the turtle pond in Central Park, and we took root there and stayed there and built the Delacorte Theater where we perform to this day. Uh, the Delacorte opened in 1962. Um, 
But it's important to understand our revival of the mobile unit in terms of both the success and the failure of Free Shakespeare in the Park. The success is easy to see. Every night we do the highest quality Shakespeare production starring some of the greatest actors in the English speaking world, Meryl Streep, Raul Julia, James Earl Jones, Sam Waterston, Anne Hathaway, Audra McDonald, for an audience of 2,000 people who are seeing it for free who have paid nothing except sweat equity for those who wait in line or entering the lottery for those who are, get tickets through our new digital lottery. Uh, over 100,000 people every summer see these fantastic performances. It's a core civic ritual for the city. And as such, we've managed to put the theater in its place as a kind of uh, building block of the identity of our polis. And that's pretty exciting. Um, we've also, by removing the economic barrier, made a case that the theater belongs as a right to people, that people have a right to own the culture. They don't need to buy the culture. It is their birthright. And that's a really important statement, we believe. So look, big success. But here's the contradiction. And to me, this would have led right to the creation of the mobile unit. I arrived at the public in 2005 and rapidly realized that this magnificent program that's been imitated all over the world, groundbreaking program, is now one of the hardest tickets to get in New York City. It, we completely eliminated the barrier of economic accessibility by making the tickets free, but the cultural barriers were higher than ever. Because if you're going to go to Free Shakespeare in the Park, you have to be willing to wait in line for up to 12 hours. You have to camp out in the park. And already you are narrowing your demographic of who will even consider going to the show massively. Now, again, it does produce an incredibly exciting audience and excited audience to be there. But that's a huge problem in terms of accessibility, which is what Chase the Park was created for. So we did two things about it. One, as I mentioned earlier, we also created a digital lottery. So there's an awful lot of people who can't possibly put aside the time to wait in the middle of Central Park. And so now they can enter a lottery and, and receive the ticket without having waited in line. We've also done a really conscientious job of setting up outer borough distribution sites. And for this, we have cooperated and made partners of the public libraries in all five boroughs. And with them, our brilliant director of uh, long-term planning, Kara Murphy, has created a distribution system for those tickets so that people from all five boroughs in the most, uh, the people who have the greatest barriers to access are able to get tickets and come to the park. We know this has succeeded because we can measure it. And where uh, the park used to consist of well over 85% of the audience were Manhattanites. Now it's only slightly above 60% and the rest come from the outer boroughs. Where we used to be one of the most diverse theater audiences in New York, which meant we were only 72% white people, we're now down to 62% white people. That's, those are really significant margins, particularly when we consider the size of the audience that gathers there every summer, every summer except last summer. Can I hurry, can I hurry. So um, I, I'm sorry, I'm going off a little bit of a tangent, but I think it's important to explain all this because one of the things that we had to then figure out is, okay, since this ticket is so hard to get, what are we going to do to achieve the core original impulse of making Shakespeare everybody's property? That's what Free Shakespeare started as. And reviving the mobile unit seemed the right thing to do. And that meant taking Shakespeare to where the people were. And in this, I was fortunate to know um, an extraordinary pioneer in the theater, Michelle Hensley, who started a company called 10,000 Things, which is still going strong in Minneapolis, which tours uh, productions of all kinds to prisons, halfway houses, inaccessible places, people where, where the people have been denied culture across the Twin Cities area. So collaborating with Michelle brought her to New York. She directed the first production of the Revived Mobile, which was a production of Measure for Measure that toured to prisons and halfway houses and women's bedded, women's shelters, you name it, across the five boroughs. It was a brilliant success. 
and we've been doing so two or three times a year ever since for the last uh, uh, 12 years, I guess. And it's been an astonishing success for us. And part of what happens is that the mobile proves that the appetite for Shakespeare is everywhere that Shakespeare is not an author who only appeals to the elite or only appeals to the educated. Uh, all of these cultural barriers to assimilating Shakespeare, we've demonstrated, can be overcome. And, you know, for me, the prototypical example of this, the sort of paradigmatic example, is we'll go to a, a men's prison. And the men's prison, unlike the women's prison, is a very restrictive emotional space expressing emotion, certainly expressing enthusiasm, is viewed as a sign of weakness. So we go into the prison, we set up rows of chairs so about in a square, so about 100 people watching the show, and the prisoners come in and both literally and metaphorically fold their arms across the chest and just be like this. And then we start the production. And within a few minutes, you can see melting starting to happen. And the first melting is coming because people realize they can understand Shakespeare. And we don't, you know, translate these works. This is the original Elizabethan language. We didn't do any of this no fear Shakespeare stuff. This is Shakespeare words, and made a cut to a 90 minute intermission spot, but it's Shakespeare. And, but of course, when they're played on stage, you can understand them always. And, you know, frankly, I'm sure it's even true of you and me, David, that if you take one of the plays that you haven't seen very often, like Henry VI, Part Three, you know, the first few minutes, you're not getting every word. But then you start to follow the actions and the intentions of the characters, and you're right back inside it. And I can see the prisoners realize that they can understand it, and that starts to open them up. And then they realize that they're caring about what happens to the characters. And that's an extraordinary second transformation. And then, you know, I can't prove this, but I have talked to a lot of people and I felt it and it's been reported to me that then there's a third reaction, which is the sense of pride that they understand Shakespeare, pride that Shakespeare belongs to them because Shakespeare is kind of a key to the cultural table in the United States. It means the peak of the mountain, right? It's the pinnacle of our culture. And if they can understand it, and if they can identify with it, if they can care about it, that is actually saying to people who society has done its worst to, there's a place for you at the heart of our culture. You belong here. And I think that is so powerful. And of course, I'm sure before we're done with this conversation, we'll get to the question of should Shakespeare continue to be central to our culture? And this is an exhibit. But I want to just, I, I can't help it. I'm not really an academic, despite all my university titles. Um, uh, I'm, I'm really just a, a jumped up storyteller. So I got to tell you a story. That, that first production, Measure, measure for Measure, one of my favorite actors, a wonderful actress named Nicole Watson, who was actually in our revival of hair just before she did this was playing Isabel. And if you remember the first big scene or the second scene actually that Isabel has with Angelo, um, you know, Isabel is going to plead for the life of her brother and Angelo says, you know, he'll live if you will sleep with me. And she says, good God, no, but you know, dearer than a brother's life is a sister's chastity, chastity which in the men's prison, makes her really an unlikable character for a long time. <laughs> you can just feel the men go, what? But in case, we're doing this on this particular day in a women's prison, on the, which at that time was on the west side of Manhattan. And Angelo leaves the stage and Nicole is left alone and she turns to the audience in, in soliloquy style and says um, Shakespeare's line, to whom should I complain? And immediately somebody in the audience shouts out, the police! And, you know, Nicole is a little bit startled. But then she simply says the next line of the soliloquy to the woman. If I did report this, who would believe me? And the woman says, no one, girl. And it's like suddenly, uh, of course, it's, it's a very moving moment. 
but it's also an incredibly geeky moment for us Shakespeare folks because you're like, of course, do we think the groundlings were like hushing each other when those soliloquies happen? There's a call and response built in here. That's actually part of the way that this language and this theatrical event was created. And we're rediscovering it by going to an audience who, you know, hasn't been trained in 21st century social niceties. Um, I love the program. Um, we, we are expanding the program. We're bringing it back this summer in outdoor spaces because we can't go indoors. And, you know, maybe it closes about the, uh, the mobile uh, theater. We know it is the only program we do where the demographics of the audience exactly match the demographics of New York City. We've done this. You know, we, we, we have diverse audiences in a number of our programs. We do better by far than most of the theaters. But the only place where we actually meet the exact people of New York City is in the mobile unit. Because we go to where they are. We don't ask them to come to us. And that is it for me was a huge lesson of what we have to do if we're going to make the theater as central to the culture as I think it should be. Sorry, Dave, you asked a simple question and I talked for 20 minutes. I, 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 was, I was hoping and planning on that. I, 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 did you want to talk about the, the evolution of the public works? or I, I, I'm happy to. As, um, uh, your audience can, of course, take a break anytime they want. They don't have to listen to me talk. Um, Public Works was uh, the next stage, really, in our uh, development of our uh, interaction with our audience. And Public Works was really the brainchild of the brilliant, brilliant theater director, Lear de Bessonet. And Lear and I got to know each other, introduced by my associate artistic director, Maria, Maria Goyanis, who's now artistic director of Woolly Mammoth in Washington, D.C. And Lou and I embarked on about a year-long conversation about how, how we could make the theater even more important in the life of the city, even more central to those who didn't have access to the theater. And one of the keys, I think, to this program is that Lear and I came to it from very different directions. Um, I was raised by communists, um, members of the Communist Party, really serious, serious folks, three generations. Um, and although I never joined the party, and although I have strayed from the orthodoxy in which I was raised, nonetheless, many of the values that were in that mode of thought have stayed with me and I cherish. Leo was raised in an extreme Christian, um, I don't want to say cult, but let's say in a particularly extreme form of Christianity. And she was a bride of Jesus when she was a young woman. And she too strayed from the orthodoxy of Christianity, but has retained many of those core beliefs and values as central to her. So where I am likely to talk about the class struggle and the necessity of changing the property relationships and the importance of fundamental equality of all people. Lear will just talk about the divine spark in every human soul. And she was the first person who would talk that language to me that I would get chills. Um, and it's because of her, she's an amazing woman and I, I understood that. And so that combination of a kind of spiritual sense of the value of individual people and a social sense of the necessity of changing the owners of the culture came together after a year of conversations. We actually, we, we had it, but six months in, we, we created sort of a watch. We don't publicize this, but we created sort of a slogan that, that our goal was to change theater from being a commodity back into what it actually is, which is a set of relationships among human beings to lose the thingness of theater. And what Lear did was find five community-based organizations, one in each of the five boroughs, and she talked to and got to know dozens in order to pick those five. We formed a year-long relationship, with it, well, which has now turned into a 10-year relationship with those organizations. And part of her brilliance 
was the starting point of the Rosh Group, which is that we went to those organizations and said, here's who we are, here's what we do, here's our skill set, what would you like from us? What would, what would be good for you? What would serve your mission? And the, the one that was the biggest stretch for me is the uh, senior program at the Brownsville Recreation Center. It's the poorest zip code in New York, where the female seniors at the Brownsville Center, the thing they wanted from us was a jazzercise class. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we did it. We started doing a jazzercise class. And as the relationship developed, they got kind of interested in dance in a broader sense. And so the first year that we did a big public work show, they ended up doing a dance in the show. And indeed, that became sort of their thing, which is the choreography for our senior citizens, some as old as 90, from the Brooklyn, uh, the Brownsville Senior Center. Um, and as the years have gone by, they've gotten more and more interested in all of the different things we do. Till two years ago, I sat and I got to watch an all-female senior production of Fences that they put on, and it was fantastic. So, you know, again, that that but the race began not by saying we have this thing we want to give you or we have this thing we want you to do. We began by saying we're a resource for you, and then as we develop a real relationship, then we'll start to talk about other places it can go. So the climax of the year's worth of work in the public works with these different community-based organizations is a large-scale participatory pageant um, that includes the best actors in New York City, Tony Award winners side by side with people who've never been on stage or who've just come out of prison after 20 years. I mean, it, the whole gamut of humanity. And the first time 10 years ago, we did three nights at the Delacorte, um, which is a 2000 seat theater in Central Park where we do Shakespeare in the Park with a 200 person cast. And it was an original musical version of The Tempest, getting cut to 90 minutes and adding songs by great songwriter Todd Almond, performed by over 200 uh, citizens of New York, five of whom were professional actors, five of whom were professional musicians, and all the rest of them were not professionals. And I was scheduled to be there the first night and the third night, because, you know, that, that was a lot. I had other things to do. After the first night, I was so bowled over, I canceled my Saturday night plans, and I've never missed a public works performance since, because I knew that what we were doing was going to be um, good social work. I knew it was going to be good for the people, you know, because I know the power that Shakespeare's language has. I know the power of working with the new What I didn't realize and was a wonderful, delightful shock to me was that I was seeing the best theater I was going to see all year. Mm -hmm. And that has been true every year since. The fundamental proposition underneath public works is that artistic talent is not a binary. It's not some people are artists and other people aren't. Some people have talent and other people don't. It's saying actually artistry is a core component of what it means to be human. And everybody has artistic talent. Everybody has the desire, even the need to express that artistic talent. And everybody has something to offer. And some of us, like Malcolm Gladwell teaches us, get to practice at 10,000 hours in a few years. And some of us get to do it 80 hours a week in our professional lives. Other people have far less opportunities. But it's not once an artist and one isn't. It's just we're on a scale. We're just on a continuum. And that proposition manifested by those productions has turned out to be, uh, you know, one of the things I'm proudest of in my whole career. It has absolutely transformed the public theater. It has transformed the relationship that we have to our community. It has been picked up across the country. There are now 18 affiliate theaters scattered across the country, all of them do public works programs. And it's gone overseas. The National Theater of Great Britain has formed a program as an offshoot of our public works. They, they don't call it public works, they call it public acts, because apparently public works, there's too much about electricity. Um, so, but it's, it's an offshoot of our program and it's magnificently successful over there too. So it's, 
what, what I'm so proud of it is that it's changing, again, not just who gets to come to the theater, it's changing who gets to make the theater. And therefore, how do we define the theater's role in our lives? And um, there's much more to say about the program. That's the introduction. And just to get us back to the topic at hand, both of those programs have firmly rested on the shoulders of William Shakespeare. And I think that the fact that they work with the works of William Shakespeare is part of what has made them so successful. I have to ask, since you, you alluded uh, earlier in your, when you were talking about the, the mobile unit and the evolution of that, and you paused one moment and said, that, of course, there's the question of whether or not Shakespeare should be so central to our culture. And uh, th that this is something I wanted to ask you. I mean, I, I'm a true believer. So when you, you talk about Shakespeare, that everybody has should have access, everybody can understand it, that, that you know, everybody owns the culture. That's also inspiring to me. Um, is that ultimately the answer to those who, who might say, as some have said, particularly in the last year, you know, that the classics uh, as, as, as something that are sort of focused on in college curricula are too, too elite, you know, elitist, uh, maybe even racist. I mean, I think people have said that, you know, that, that actually classicism is actually inherently racist and therefore Shakespeare as sort of the epitome of classicism may come to a particular screen. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder, um, I mean, it, would your answer be, you know, in a sense what you've already said, or do you have, is there some other more pointed way you can kind of defend Shakespeare? If I can put you on the spot a little bit. Sure. I'm delighted to be put on the spot by you, David, but I, I got to tell you, uh, this is mild compared to the spot my own staff has put me on over the last year, because I've had people on my own staff saying, why are we focused so much on Shakespeare? And the discussions have been rich and deep and lively. And the fundamental thing I want to say is that loving Shakespeare and believing in Shakespeare exempts none of us from having to cope with the genuine inequities in our society. So one of the first principles is you have to examine how you're using Shakespeare. And Shakespeare can be used to share the wealth of society or Shakespeare can be used as a way of putting up a barrier to separate the educated and the elite from the uneducated and from the masses. And Shakespeare has been used both ways historically. Um, you know, it is why I have such a violent reaction to what is called the Shakespeare controversy, the authorship controversy. Um, because Shakespeare was, of course, one of the best known people in London, which was a relatively small community at the time. He spent his entire working life, not in any kind of hermitage or alone away, but being an actor, working with the company, and doing his entire lifetime. And for 200 years afterwards, no one ever suggested that he didn't write his own works. It never, it, there's not a hint of it anywhere. The whole idea started in the early 19th century, and the intent of the controversy was clear, to suggest that England's greatest author and the English language's greatest practitioner could not be an uneducated commoner from Stratford who had an eighth grade education and was a commoner's son. We needed to reconstruct the class barrier to prove either A, that he was actually an aristocrat, or B, that he was an Oxford or Cambridge grad, or ideally both. And that has been the root of the authorship controversy ever since. The attempt to re-enlist Shakespeare as a defender, as a bulwark of class society. And we see how art forms get used by this, like this all the time. We see how the opera has been used this way. We see how the ballet has been used this way. The United States is the only country on the planet where operas are routinely performed in their original languages and not translated. Why? Because the people who first started creating these great operatic institutions in the United States wanted to form a barrier between them and the unwashed. They wanted to have their own form of art that by appreciating it, they could prove who was in the club and who was outside the club. So that's the first thing. You have to commit yourself, whether you're working with Shakespeare or anybody else, that you will not let him be used as a way to exclude people. 
you also, and at the public theater, we take this very seriously, you will also not let him suck up all the air in the room. You will not let our commitment to Shakespeare reduce or slacken our commitment to new voices, to black voices, to Asian American voices, to Latinx voices, to native voices. We will make sure that Shakespeare is sitting side by side with the people who are creating the canon of our day, who eventually we hope a hundred years from now will be performed with the regularity that Shakespeare is being performed. So that's part. Third thing, you have to commit to using Shakespeare, not glorifying him or validating him. Um, in other words, I'll give you an example of this. Hair, our great rock musical, which also premiered at the Public Theater, I'm happy to say, and which we very successfully revived about 11 to 12 years ago, um, is modeled on Hamlet. We did uh, One Summer in the Park, which was both Hair and Hamlet, and my publicity department asked me for a synopsis of the plays so they could put in the program. And I sent them a synopsis and they wrote back and said, well, thank you for the synopsis of Hamlet, but where's the synopsis of Hare? I said, read it more closely. That's the synopsis of both plays. So in other words, Shakespeare is not some kind of holy scripture that is there to be studied and reified and venerated. He's there for our use. He's there for us to take him and use him for our purposes in our time, which is why we can do 90 minute versions in prisons, why we can do musical pageants in the park, or why we can do a play like Fat Ham that's in a coming season where James L. James, a fantastic young playwright, has taken Hamlet and set it at a black barbecue in contemporary America. That he is, he is there to be used for by us for the artistic purposes of our time. And, the, the, and sometimes those artistic purposes mean that we leave the text unchanged and uncut. Sometimes we cut it. That's a practical aesthetic decision based on what the production is trying to do, not based on what the rules are. And finally, we get to the question of Shakespeare's unique qualities. And I would say that there's two things that we have to pay attention to. I have never found another author, and as near as I can tell, nor has anybody else, whose works have this kind of magic ability to take on the tenor of their times, to actually to be reinterpreted and to feel completely fresh in hundreds of different cultures in four different centuries. And that permeability, that chameleon-like quality is absolutely extraordinary in Shakespeare. And I've never found another writer who can match that. And a huge part of that, I think, is that Shakespeare is a genuinely colossally great writer, not only language-wise, but in the characters and situations that he, he dramatizes. Um, he's incapable of writing a character who isn't fully human, with, in my experience, the sole exception of St. John um, and you know, St. John is a witch and a, literally a demon in the Henry VI place. Um, and, you know, his hatred of the French was so great, he couldn't, even he couldn't make St. John. You know, but he was young. But every other character, whether he intends it or not, becomes human as soon as they start to speak. He cannot, he, 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 and it's extraordinary quality. But there's another quality that I don't think is talked about anywhere near as often. And that is that Shakespeare was writing for an audience that had never existed before because of the nature of the Tudor compromise and therefore the banning of religious subject matter on stage. He was faced for the first time with not only not needing to follow religious prescriptions for what the play was, but actually being told he couldn't follow religious prescriptions. It also, we, had, we are at the beginnings of modern capitalism. And the King's Men, of course, are a joint stock company, and Shakespeare is a part owner. So he needs to get people to pay to fill those seats every night. And because of the nature of the times and the beginning of capitalism, the people who are going to fill that, uh, the, that stage is everybody, that audience, from illiterate groundlings to the Queen of England to Oxford 
grad so that the whole realm of, of British society is going to gather at the same time in one place, and he's got to entertain all of them at the same time. And when I was young, I, I occasionally, I know not with you or anybody in the audience, David, but academics don't always understand exactly how Shakespeare works in performance. And I was told that in Shakespeare's plays, you could actually divide up the sections and that there was the clown stuff that was in prose and that was meant to please the groundlings. And then there was the high literary stuff, the soliloquies that were meant to please the educated people. And, you know, as a teenager, I bought it. And then as I started producing Shakespeare, I realized this is just nonsense. And of course, it doesn't work at any play on earth because you can't do a play that's entertaining sections of your audience at different times and not being received by the rest of the audience at the same time. The whole point of a play is to try to turn the audience into one audience, sharing a common experience. If you don't do that, the play doesn't work. And, you know, we viscerally know this. You know, you sit in an auditorium and if everybody's coughing because they can't bring themselves to pay full attention, you got a flop on your hands. If you've got a success on your hands, it's because everybody's quiet at the same moments because they know they are equally invested in what happens next. So Shakespeare was writing for the most democratic audience that any theater had had since the Greeks. And there, there had not been a moment in the past 2000 years where that many diverse people would gather together and asking to be entertained at the same time. And Shakespeare had to figure out how to do that. And of course, by being asked to be entertained on a deeper level, they're also needing to be shown what they all have in common. Because if he can't do that, he can't forge them into one audience and get that standing ovation at the end. So his plays have to reflect back to that audience what all of them share about their humanity. And so the history plays, better than anything else, define what it means to be British. You see those history plays? Because he's actually creating Britain's idea of himself in the theater every night. And that means those plays were written to be democratic. They were written to be diverse. They were written to show a widely divergent group of people what they all had in common with one another. And that power, I think, he was always a great poet, but it was that audience that made him a great playwright. I'm going to make one final point, and then I promise I'll be quiet, David, but um, the, the Jonathan Bate uh, in his book, The Genius of Shakespeare, I think articulated this best. He said, if there had not been a storm in the English Channel in the summer of 1588, this book would be called The Genius of Lope de Vega. Mm -hmm. And the triumph of Shakespeare around the world is inseparable from the triumph of the English-speaking people around the world. That because the English-speaking peoples have become the dominant economic, political, military force around the world, an English-speaking writer has become the common touchstone for the entire planet. You can judge that. You can say that's too bad or that was wrong, but you can't dispute it. It's the truth. So what I've experienced is that for better or for worse, feeling like you can own Shakespeare, feeling like you can understand Shakespeare, feeling like Shakespeare belongs to you, is a key to feeling like you're a full citizen of the culture and of the world. And it's not the only thing we need to give people. But it's a really important thing we need to give people to let them know that, you know, I think, uh, I'm not sure who it famous who said this, but famously Bellow once said, who's the Shakespeare of the Zulus? And this answer was Shakespeare is the Shakespeare of the Zulus to try and divide him up as the property of a you know, bunch of pallid people on a northern rainy island is insane. He's all of our property. So. That's the argument that I make. And, you know, really, the, the I'm just trying to articulate something that I actually see in practice as I run a theater and make Shakespeare. I, this, I'm not speaking theoretically. I'm speaking from what I, I see works. And it's why I believe in continuing to do it. 
Right, you know, I, I, thank you for all of that. And please, you know, don't ever uh, doubt yourself. You're <laughs> you're an inspiring and, and voluble speaker. Uh, I was thinking of that, you know, your use, your use of the word use, you know, that, that Shakespeare is, uh, his plays are material for use, and how we use them will determine whether or not it's elitist and, and Eurocentric or whether or not it's, it's uh, empowering everyone to own the culture. Uh, I wonder how you feel about uh, there's a particular performance, Shakespearean performance scholar who said to direct Shakespeare is to today, to, today to direct Shakespeare is to fix Shakespeare, in particular as regards political relevance. I'm just wondering how you feel about that idea that, that you know, when you talk about using Shakespeare in the way that's, that's empowering and addresses diversity, are you talking about fixing Shakespeare in the manner this critic is referring to? So I, I had a little acoustic problem there, David. He said that to direct Shakespeare is to fix Shakespeare? Well, I think the idea is that um, if you just leave the players alone, um, they're not going to uh, achieve the kind of breakthrough that you're describing in which they reach everyone. You, you have to sort of recontextualize, reconfigure. Um, well, here's a specific Example, maybe, uh, you tell me, um, uh, you were quoted uh, a few years ago in, in when you were discussing uh, an upcoming production, an all-female production at the public of uh, Taming of the Shrew, and you were quoted as having said, you know, this is a play that for 40 years I just, I could never imagine doing, I couldn't find a way to kind of stand behind it, uh, but I saw through this brilliant production that there is a way to sort of make the play a critique or deconstruction of misogyny and wife beating instead of a play about it. Now, assuming for a moment that that was an accurate quote, would that be, an, would that be an example of, of sort of making performance that fix a problem that otherwise would be provocative? All right. This is a subject I have strong feelings about, but, but perhaps I, I think they're kind of nuanced. I don't, you know, we'll see. The first is, Performing Shakespeare is never fixing Shakespeare. It's creating a performance of Shakespeare. Shakespeare's plays as written material are not the art form he was creating. They are the score for the art form he was creating. The plays on the page have the same relationship to what he was doing as the score of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony as to a performance of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. The writing is not the artistic expression, the performance is. And we, we know this. I mean, Shakespeare never oversaw the publication of a single one of his plays. He didn't care about his plays. The folio wasn't until years after he was dead. He didn't care about books, he cared about performance. And that's the wonderful nature of our art form. No matter how you try, you can't leave the plays alone. You can't do them as they were done because you're always in a specific place and a specific moment when you produce Shakespeare. Not whatever concept, whatever you're trying to do, the art form requires you to be in the moment. And so that means that whether you like it or not, you are bringing the moment to Shakespeare. You are bringing your place, your time to Shakespeare. The only question is, how conscious are you of it? And what choices are you making about it? As somebody who's run theaters that do Shakespeare for 40 years, I can't, it doesn't happen as much anymore, but in the early part of my career, you know, people say, are, are you doing real Shakespeare? Are you doing regular Shakespeare? Uh, are you doing Shakespeare, uh, you know, as it was written? And always when they ask those questions, they don't mean what they're asking because they have no idea how Shakespeare, but they have no idea how it was cast. They're referring to the style that they saw Shakespeare in when they were growing up, which had a lot of tights and doublets in it, and a lot of, I mean, I grew up literally next door to the Guthrie Theater, and at that point, all the actors, it's a wonderful theater, but when the actors did Shakespeare, they all, because they came from Juilliard, spoke in something called Mid-Atlantic, which is a artificial dialect that was created that's supposed to be half English and half American, but a way to do. But I tell you, to my little Minnesota ears, they were talking with English accents. They weren't talking like me. And the first time I saw actors not putting on an accent, 
Buffett talking in their rich native tone. First time I saw Raul Julia performing Shakespeare, sounding every bit the Puerto Rican he was. That's when Shakespeare became alive for me. Because, you know, Shakespeare, as he wrote it, as it was done originally, all of that is just a way of saying we're dressing him up in a way that makes him feel comfortably academic, comfortably foreign, comfortably removed from most of the people around us so that we can celebrate our own academic truth, our own culture, class truth. It doesn't actually mean doing Shakespeare. Because, you know, again, as I said, you always are bringing something. So the only question is, are you going to do that in a way that is powerful and smart and evocative? Or are you going to do it in a kind of unthought through boring way? And are you going to have a good production or are you going to have a bad production? And what we've seen with Shakespeare is he will carry an enormous number of different points of view, as long as they are points of view that really rest within the action of the text, that aren't trying to contradict the action of the text. So this is why for me, um, and I know this is not true for my friend and colleague, Ayanna Thompson, but why um, Taming the Shrew holds a unique place in the canon. Because Taming of the Shrew, the central action of the play, is the taming of the shrew. The action of the play requires a man to break a woman's spirit and make her subservient. And that means that you either do that and set out to get laughs with that and stand behind that, or you somehow try to subvert the play while you're doing the play and make it not so bad and make Catherine grin a little at the end when she does the speech and, you know, try to soften the edges of it, which I hate. And so I've never found a way to just do a production show that I felt comfortable with. Um, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, I used to get asked to direct show all the time because everybody knew I was a lefty and they thought, well, if he does it, then we'll be, you know, immune to criticism. And I always said no. Um, what Phila Lloyd did in her brilliant production time of the show in the park was exactly as you said. She actually didn't do Shrew. She deconstructed Shrew. It was a commentary on Shrew. And it was a brilliant and wonderful theatrical commentary. But I actually ended up feeling ambivalent about doing it in the park. Because, because of the very fact that it was deconstructing Shrew, it actually required the audience to have some knowledge of Shrew in order to appreciate the deconstruction. So it actually turned out to be more limited in its appeal, although, I mean, we've had a full theater every night, you know, when we give the tickets away, that helps. It, it said, but it, it didn't really land because the populist tradition of the park, the, the rule of thumb, we always say, is somebody should be able to walk in here when they've never seen a play before and be able to enjoy and appreciate what they're watching on stage. And so I ended up feeling a little bit like, oh my, what we kind of produced there was a commentary on true more than true. And it was brilliant and spectacular. And I would do it downtown in a heartbeat because we have a different mission downtown. But I didn't quite consider it, you know, hitting the center of the mark in the park. I do not have that problem with any other of Shakespeare's plays. And that includes Othello, that includes Merchant of Venice. Um, with Merchant, uh, which I can speak of because I think we did a fantastically successful production of Merchant about 10 years ago with Al Pacino, Shylock, Dan Sullivan directed it. And Merchant is not an anti-Semitic play. It is a play that takes place in an anti-Semitic world. And that distinction is enormously important. Shakespeare makes Shylock completely human and understandable. And he probably did it against his own conscious desires because, you know, as near as we can tell, Shakespeare at that time, uh, Shylock in Shakespeare's time would have worn a red wig and, you know, a hooked nose and looked like a, you know, something that would shock us out of the theater today. But then you read what Shakespeare wrote for him and, oh my God, is he human? Oh my God, is he three dimensional? Oh my God. And so, when Dan produced the play, the only, you know, he, he produced a, you know, set in sort of the Edwardian England, and um, it, it, it was powerful, and, you know, we, we felt, uh, for Shylock, we felt 
from the contradictions of Shylock, we felt for everybody in the play. The one thing that really changed is what Dan referred to as the play slipped categories. Mm -hmm. The play was no longer actually a comedy. Mm -hmm. And the particular genius of Dan's production is that the fifth act, after the trial, was unbelievably melancholy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what one felt is the sort of... um, the destruction that had happened in all of those relationships with Bassanio, with Portia, with all of them, because they revealed themselves to be less than fully human, less than fully compassionate humans, and they all seen each other do that. So it had this wonderful melancholy of it. And then Dan created an image. And it's I love this because he did exactly what a great director should do. He took something that was in Shakespeare, and it was only spoken of in Shakespeare, but then he put it on stage, which was Shylock's baptism. Mm -hmm. And he just did what Shakespeare, Shylock had been condemned to being baptized. So we saw Shylock being manhandled to the center of the stage, his kipper thrown away, and him dumped under the water, looked more like waterboarding than baptizing. It was just excruciating. And then Pacino, frail, soaking wet, and humiliated, gets out of this water, picks up his skull cap, puts it back on, and walks into the crowd of thugs who have just baptized when the lights go out. It was brilliant, but it wasn't imposed on Merchant of Venice. It's there in Merchant of Venice. Shakespeare says it. And Dan just said, well, what does a forced baptism look like? And now we have to sort of show that and show the violence side if we're going to actually tell the story of Merchant of Venice. So, you know, we're always of our moment. We are never um, out of time. We're never out of history. That is the, the prison house of our art form but it is the huge liberation of our art form that we are forced to be in the moment, uh, whether we're doing a new play or Shakespeare. And our job is just to try to make something that will land in our moment, in our place, as powerfully as possible. Well, it seems to me be a good entree to asking the question, perhaps the inevitable question about Julius Caesar and, and, you know, why Julius Caesar? I think I read somewhere that it's actually your, your favorite Caesar tragedy. I don't know if that's an accurate quote or not. But uh, besides that personal fondness and, and hearing, it, of course, you're quite accurate and, uh, you know, sort of, again, inevitable affirmation that theater has to speak to the moment. So what was it about Julius Caesar then uh, at that particular moment that, that uh, lent itself? Yeah. Well, usually um, what I experience is we do a Shakespeare production for all sorts of reasons. And then I have countless people saying, oh, my God, that was just the right show to do at this moment. And usually I find that whatever Shakespeare you've done, if you do it well, well enough, it feels like just the right show to be done at this moment. But this is the one show that was different, which is I was planning in November of 2016 to do Richard II as my opening show in the park that summer. And then the election happened. And the election uh, of uh, the 45th president came as a colossal blow, not only to me, not only to America, but very much to my staff. And, you know, the the next day we had a Quaker meeting just to, the whole staff, just to talk about what was in our hearts and the sense of betrayal, the amount of weeping. And, you know, I discovered that something I, you know, I, Maybe I'd known this intellectually, but I hadn't experienced it viscerally. That the staff at the public theater is pretty, we're pretty big by this point. We have about 250 full time year on staff members. And what I saw in that Quaker meeting was that about half of them were young people, meaning, you know, under or just over 30, who had been born somewhere in the country where they felt oppressed, even violated. Um, uh, uh, out of place, persecuted, and they had fled to the first in the theater and then to the New York theater as a way of finding a home. And these kids were gay, 
These kids were trans. These kids were BIPOC. There were a million reasons that they, but all of them had fun. And what, one of my staff members said that meeting, I will never forget it. He said, yesterday, my father voted for his wallet over his son. And it was just devastating to hear that, to realize. And at that moment, I didn't, I can't put on Richard II. I have to put on Julius Caesar. Because, and I will say this now, I wanted to kill that guy. And so I need to do a play about people who set out to kill their dictatorial leader. And I don't know if Shakespeare's, if Julius Caesar is my favorite Shakespeare, but it's the Shakespeare I know the best. I've done it four times now. I, mean, I love this play. I know it very, very well. And what I realized was that, the again, not just the, the characters or sorry, but the core action of Julius Caesar was exactly a story I wanted to tell right now, where a group of progressive people who believed in their democracy see their democracy threatened by a populist demagogue and decide to try to preserve their democracy through assassination and end up bringing about not only the end of the Roman Republic and the rise of the Roman Empire, but the vanishing of democracy from the face of the globe for almost 2,000 years. They bring about the exact opposite of what they set out to do. And I went, you know, that's a story that we could tell. And so this is the one time I have specifically picked a Shakespeare production to do because of a specific political situation around us. And I kept, in, as I was rehearsing it, I kept, you know, sort of trying to see if I could find it in my heart to be more subtle. And, you know, we started to work with it. And by God, Greg Henry, who played Julius Caesar, started doing the gestures and started doing the voice. And then eventually, of course, you know, wore the hair and got the extra long tie. And Tina Benko, this wonderful, wonderful actress playing Calpurnia, started to use a Slovakian accent. And I kept sitting back and I said, okay, at some point I'm going to think this is too much, aren't I? And I'm just going to you know, it's not too much. It's what I want it to be. I want the hammer to be this blunt right now. I want to make this unmistakable in what we're talking about. And uh, so we did. And um, against the... Uh, instincts of some of our actors who thought I was being too crude, but yeah, we, that's what we did. Um, and when we put it up, we had the experience of the production working better than I could have hoped. And why is that? Be not because, you know, we managed to make it relevant to the assassination of Trump, but because we did what the theater does, which is play out dreams, fantasies, unconscious urges. When Aristotle says that protagonists and tragedies are better than normal people, he doesn't mean they're a better class. I mean, that's what the French neoclassicists thought he meant. But what, they, what he meant was that they are more willing to follow through on their objectives than we are. They are more willing to actually do what they feel like doing than we are. And so the fascination for us is watching what happens when a character actually does the thing that I've fantasized about. And that was exactly what was happening in Central Park every night in the summer of 2017. This group of characters were acting out the fantasy of assassinating Donald Trump through the story of Julius Caesar. And in acting that fantasy, we then saw what happened as a result, which is the complete and utter destruction of democracy. And it may be the only time that I've directed a production that I felt absolutely had political catharsis at the center of it. And you could tell from the audience reaction, because, you know, the first couple of acts, the audience laughed every time Greg was on stage, every time he did something trouble, gales of laughter. You know, I have to admit, I played to it a little bit, and, you know, the act three, scene two, uh, I brought him up from the trap in a, naked in a gold bathtub, and, you know, it's, I went for it. Like I said, it was not nuanced. 
And, um, you know, the arms went crazy laughing. And it kept doing that all the way till we got to the Senate and the assassination scene. I'm sorry, I meant Act 2, Scene 2, of course, before. Uh, and in the assassination scene, you could just feel the audience getting quieter and quieter. And then the first preview, when Caesar got stabbed by the conspirators and fell down dead, I remember there was one audience member who didn't get the memo and who started to clap and then realized nobody else was clapping and the clap died away. And that was the last time that anybody celebrated the death of Caesar in the park. It was a horrifying event. So we'd taken the audience of admittedly mostly liberal New Yorkers on that journey of here's the, here's the fantasy that you're going to kill Donald Trump and it's going to liberate you. The reality is you're going to do that and it's going to destroy us. This is an anti-assassination play. And always was. What I was uh, ignorant about is the way our culture changed. Because I expected that this would be controversial. But what I was imagining is there would be raging controversial debates about Julius Caesar. What I didn't realize is there were raging debates about six seconds of iPhone footage that somebody had illegally shot in the audience that played on Hannity and a couple of photographs of a bloody Trump-like looking figure that got spun into a narrative of liberals in New York are cheering as President Trump is stabbed to death on stage. And that was, Hannity talked about us every day for two weeks. It was, um, you know, it was Fox, it was Breitbart, it was scattered over. Them. It became a, you know, a worldwide firestorm about this one. And then I had what I thought was a stroke of genius, which is on opening night of the play, I got on, on stage and I said, everybody take your iPhones up. And everybody, you can film me. And I want to make my statement. And I made this wonderful, nuanced, compassionate speech about, you know, the catharsis and how this is anti blah, 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 blah. And everybody filmed it and it went out and it was seen by dozens of NPR subscribers. So a lot of people saw it, but everybody who saw it, and I got tons of approval for it from all of the people inside the blue ball. The people who watched Hannity didn't know I'd made a speech. The people who watched Fox News had no idea that I'd ever spoken. I should have insisted that Hannity take me on the air. And he would have made mincemeat out of me if he let me on. I don't care. I would have been having a chance to talk directly to that audience. And instead, I was just so self-satisfied with my little public television, public radio, public theater, good guy credentials that I let it sit at that. As a result, about a week later, I got a call from the Secret Service. Um, or, you know, who actually first called my daughter's cell phone. Yeah. And my daughter called me and said, hey, Dad, um, the Secret Service just called her. I gave them your cell phone. And I went, Kyle, how do you know it was the Secret Service? Said, well, they said they were the Secret Service. And I said, Kyle, don't. But sure enough, my cell phone rang. And I said, this is the Secret Service. And I said, it's fine. What's your name? And he told me. And I said, I'm hanging up the phone. And I'm dialing the number in the phone book for the New York branch of the Secret Service. I'm going to ask for you, and I hope you're there. Turns out he was there. It was real. And he said, uh, Mr. Eustace, we're coming to your office at 1 o'clock this afternoon to interview you. He didn't ask. He told me. So a couple hours later, I'm in my office, and these two guys who look like they're straight out of men in black, you know, black suits, skinny black ties, white shirts, and come sit down, turn on the tape recorder, and say, you know, this interview is with Oscar Eustace in July of 2017, and they start asking me questions. And they asked me questions for about an hour. Have I ever contemplated violence against the president? Have I um, uh, incited anybody else to commit violence against the president? I mean, a lot of, you know, it's really serious, and I answered seriously. I didn't feel guilty, but, you know, still, it's a little intimidating. <laughs> And we get to the end of the interview by, after about an hour. And um, the agent says, uh, the interview with Mr. Hughes is now closed. And he turned up the tape recorder. And he says, Mr. Hughes, I just want to tell you 
that we have to do this interview because we received thousands of complaints at offices across the United States about this production. And we are legally required to respond to those concerns because Fox News had told people to call their offices. And he said, um, so we have done this interview and I'm going to tell you now that our investigation is now concluded and there will be no further action from our office. And by the way, I love Shakespeare in the Park. <laughs> <laughs> just totally broke his demographic for oh, It was fantastic. Um, you know, but but the the not so fantastic part of it. Uh, we I received death threats. My wife received death threats. My daughter received death threats, threats of sexual violence. My wife reported one of the threats that was left on our home answering machine to the local police. They came and they took down the uh, all of them and filed a complaint. Um, and the next day, we flew to England for a few days, literally to get away from this. And by the time the plane landed, there was a full-page photograph in the Daily Mirror of my wife and I at the opening of Shakespeare in the Park with the complete account of the phone call. The somehow the police station had leaked this story first to the New York Post and then it went to the Daily Mirror. And when Lori, my wife, called up the police station, furious that this had happened, the officer who she talked to said, I wasn't the one who did it. He didn't even pretend that it hadn't happened. Mm -hmm. um, what wasn't funny about all of this is that Shakespeare festivals across the country received threats because people apparently can't distinguish between the New York Shakespeare Festival and the Utah Shakespeare Festival. So many, many Shakespeare Festivals were caught up in this nonsense. And, you know, again, I, I think I was really ineffective about using the moment to try to really speak across the divide. And, you know, the, the learning I had from it is just, I am, like everybody else I know, capable of being smug, and self-righteous and self-centered and not realize that if I don't reach the people who think they hate me, I'm not doing any good at all. If I don't reach the people who oppose, resist the things I stand for, I'm not in dialogue with anybody but my little club. And that's the real challenge that's in front of us, David, and still is, is are we going to somehow figure out how to actually be in dialogue with a significant number of the people who feel like the economy has turned its back on them, the educational system has turned its back on them, and the culture has turned its back on them. Because we have turned our back on them. We have essentially said to half the country, we don't have anything for you and you don't have anything for us. We're going to go to the blue counties where we have audience. There's the nonprofit theaters across the country, stunningly, are in blue counties. Some of them are in red states, but they're in blue counties in red states. The nonprofit theater has abandoned half this country, and they wreaked a terrible vengeance on us in 2016. And they tried to do it on January 6th. And we just, um, you know, we, we just have to take seriously our responsibility to speak to more than our, our own folks. Sorry, again, a long speech, but there you go. No, well, I mean, I can't think of a better example of Shakespeare in politics than the <laughs> that ensued after. Uh, it's crazy. Doing your production, right? I mean, I, re I feel I read accounts of, of things erupting right in the middle of the show. Oh, we get for the last week of the show, there were right wing trolls online who I am only not going to mention my name because they don't deserve the airspace, but they're famous right wing trolls who were offering rewards money rewards to anybody who interrupted the show. And and the last four performances, every one was interrupted by somebody charging on stage and trying to stop the show. Um, the, the first time was by a right-wing nut who is now sitting in the U.S. Congress from Florida. And uh, she, and, and literally afterwards, she was escorted off stage. The show continued. 
And afterwards, we found out that she had put up a uh, plea for her legal defense fund online before she'd gone to the theater that night. And that by, you know, 10 o'clock that night, she raised $25,000 for her legal defense fund, which were, I guess she was planning to defend herself against a charge of misdemeanor trespassing, which we dropped by 11 o'clock that night. It's just, the cynicism was just unbelievable. Anyway, the money, right? Mm. Mm. Well, I think I think um, uh, we should get some questions from our viewers. At this point, um, any of you have a, a question like, after to address? So please put it in the chat, and uh, Finley uh, standing by to uh, help facilitate this process. Should we think in terms of a, a couple minutes, Finley, for this? Yes, just about that. Also, feel free to put in the chat that you want me to just stop talking. That is an acceptable response. Finley will pass that on, too. Your modesty becomes you. Well, I'm, I was thinking, too, about the I – mean, this, this is a little bit of a, a vamping, I guess, because I, I, I do want to give us a chance to ask questions because we have a couple minutes. And, you know, at the production of Twelfth Night, uh, with Cooper, mm. I realized, um, we received such ecstatic reviews and, and so much of a – focus on, in those reviews on how joyous and um, affirming it was, how much it was a kind of affirmation of empathy. Um, and I wonder, you know, do you sort of kind of back to the text and performance uh, question, which is always fascinating to me. Um, do, you, do you feel that the play, as you read it, is, a, is about that? Or does it sort of enable, again, a kind of reframing for a contemporary moment? Well, that was a public works production. And I had the great joy of producing and dramaturging it when I wasn't directing it. And then when Kwame Kwearma, the original director, had a schedule conflict when we expanded it the following year, a full six-week run, he asked me to step in and actually do the -the on-the-ground directing. And so I got it from both angles. So the actual creation of it, this was an adaptation of Twelfth Night, a musical adaptation that was by Kwame and by Shana Taub, the brilliant musician, composer, performer, who wrote the score for that and later for our public works production, As You Like It. And in working on it, the, the dramaturgical question constantly was, what is it in the text that you can then bring out and musicalize, make the theme of the songs, and will actually touch our audience? And we talked about this a lot. And one of the key questions, or one of the key things that Shana was fascinated by in Twelfth Night, was that it somehow Viola, by denying her identity, by dressing as a boy, is actually able to discover something about herself and about the world that she can't discover just by being herself. That this pretending faking is a form of self-knowledge and a a voyage of self-discovery. And I thought that was just such a beautiful response to it that we began to shape the arc of the whole show around that perception. That perception, I think, is really drawn from the text. It was not something that Shana made up. But then, of course, we used Shakespeare. And we used that story and we used much of his language. And Shana proved herself on that show. She was you know, I say she was 10 years old. She was 25, maybe, when she wrote this. I mean, she's just an astonishing talent to be not only a wonderful composer and not only a great performer, but a fantastic lyricist. So much so that I experienced that her lyrics stood side by side with Shakespeare, and she did just fine. And it wasn't just me that thought so. Um, uh, Rufus Norris, the artistic director of the National Theatre of Great Britain, saw the production and said the same thing and not only picked up the show to do it at the National, but actually invited Shana to come write other musicals at the National. Elton John has asked her, and he, she's writing the lyrics with Elton John for the musical adaptation of The Devil Wears Pravda. So, in other words, the brilliance of her lyrics began, and the way that she incorporated that into the story 
of Sebastian and Viola and Olivia and Paul Orlando was just extraordinary. Um, I hope everyone in the audience will seek out the cast album, which is findable um, in Apple Music. Uh, and you'll, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. So I, I feel like that production was really resting on the back of Shana's genius. And so in a way, it's a cheat to say the way you can adapt Shakespeare is you find another genius to adapt him. But that's what we did. Very cool. Very cool. Well, Finley, do you have some questions for us, for, for Oscar? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, Mike Jensen asks, uh, please expand on the political Shakespeare theme in specific reference to the Richard II broadcast. Right. Oh, thank you. You've clearly listened to this. We were planning to do Richard II in the park uh, this past summer of 2020. By the time it came around, things had worked out so that I wasn't available to direct it. And I asked a wonderful young director who I love and who has since become my associate artistic director, Sahim Ali, to take the helm of that production, which was going to star Andre Holland as uh, Richard II. Um, then COVID hit, and we had to pivot, and we had to make it a radio production. Okay, great. So, you know, as Sigmund worked on it, as we cast it, it was an almost entirely black cast. It was an extraordinary group of actors that were assembled, and we were ready to do the radio show. And we actually started rehearsal a week after George Floyd was murdered. And, it, you know, that we were all reeling. And Sahim was reeling, and the theater was reeling. And you know, the question we kept asking is, should we go ahead with this? What's the sense of doing Richard II at this moment? And what Sahim did brilliantly was lead off with that question on the first day of rehearsal, which was eight days after George Floyd said, why should we do this show? Which led to a passionate day-long discussion from the cast about whether they wanted to do it, what it meant to them to do it, why most of them felt it was important to do it. What, and it was just an incredibly rich conversation. One of the cast left the show at the end of the day, said that she had decided that this was not an appropriate thing for her to do at this moment. Great, bless her. But what we then decided to do was to take that conversation from that day and use it as the context for the radio production of Russian Second, which we ended up then doing in four parts but each of the parts had discussions inspired by this question of why do black people do Shakespeare? What, um, what does it mean to black theater artists to be performing Shakespeare? What does it mean to be doing Shakespeare now? What does it mean to be a black person in Shakespeare? Those discussions were incredibly rich. And, you know, whether we were successful or not, um, uh, what we set out to do was to embed the production of Richard II in a discussion about the production of Richard II that we hoped would make it more accessible to folks. And I have to say, I've been just thrilled by its reception. It's been picked up around the country. Great, thanks. Uh, what else, Finley? David Humphrey asks, do you see more political extremism now against the arts than perhaps in years past? Against the arts, you know, I fortunately, I don't feel like yet the arts are a major focus of political extremism. Individual artists' expressions are, like my production of Joe Susan, there's others, you know, Hamilton was, which we also produced, but that's another story. Um, but I am not seeing the same level of concentrated attack on the idea of the arts or the idea of the nonprofit arts that I saw during the culture war of the 80s. Um, that was a period where right-wingers and you know, particularly Jesse Helms in Congress, but a number of other right-wing folks discovered that using things like Andre Serrano's Piss Christ as a fundraising tool generated huge amounts of dollars from what at that time was direct mail from their supporters and so, again, I think completely cynically, they set about to make the NEA a um, punching bag and to do it so they could raise money. They raised an awful lot of money. They did some real and lasting damage to the NEA, but they didn't destroy the NEA. 
And indeed, the NEA has gotten a lot of new support as part of uh, the, the set of uh, revival bills that Congress has passed. Um, so we, we, we survived that. There were terrible consequences to it, which I, I could talk about, but I'm not seeing that the arts being a focus in the same way yet. Thank you. Ms. Finley. Uh, those are all the questions we have right now. Uh, viewers, please feel free to send in any more questions you have in the uh, live chat on the YouTube page. Well, while we're waiting for those, another thing I'd love to know, Oscar, is maybe a little more of a personal question, I guess, but um, is, was, do you, was Shakespeare always some uh, playwright uh, artist that you gravitated towards, or did you have a conversion experience at some point, or, um, especially given you, your upbringing, which you, you described, and that was his thinking uh, yeah. me of... Um, I, I came, you know, my, my household was... Uh, intellectuals, um, communists, communist intellectuals, but um, the, uh, and my parents divorced one day and both of them remarried and actually all four of them were professors at the University of Minnesota. <laughs> so I was, I was, you know, partly I didn't go to college uh, as an act of rebellion against them. Um, but it meant Shakespeare was around and I'd certainly read Shakespeare and seen Shakespeare, talked about Shakespeare before um, a, as a teenager. But by the time I left home, I was not only not a fan of Shakespeare, I was not a fan of writing. I was first sort of radicalized by the experimental theater movement of the early 1970s, who believed many different things, much of them self-contradictory. But one of the things that everybody was sure of is that the playwright was a denizen of the past, was a holdover from the literary antecedents of theater, and that now in our new modern experimental age, the playwright was thrown in the dustbin of history, and performance as a pure thing in itself, devised work, nonverbal work, you know, a many different forms, that, but, but the, the performance was going to be leading. And I did that work uh, passionately and with a great deal of almost uh, ideological vigor for several years, um, until I got a job at the age of 19 to go to Switzerland and start an experimental second stage for the Schauspielhaus Zurich with my Swiss colleague, Stefan Muller. And from 19 to 21, I lived in Europe um, and directed and taught in Switzerland, uh, Austria, West Germany, and East Germany. The Germanys were divided at the time. Um, and during that time, I was exposed to the German-speaking theater world, which was enormously influential on me. But I had a huge crisis of conscience um, because I realized at a certain point that what I was doing, the theater that I was making in Zurich, was actually designed to intimidate the audience into silence. Mm. And I didn't consciously know this while I was making it, but when I really had to number of things happened to force me to examine myself and realize that I was actually making a kind of avant-garde art that was doing precisely the kind of function that I was talking about earlier. In other words, allowing a certain rarefied strata of the European hoch bourgeoisie to decide that they understood things that were more experimental and progressive and innovative than the normal audience that therefore by liking the work I was doing, they didn't understand it, but they pretended to understand it. And that elevated them into a kind of um, elite cultural class. And that I had no idea of who this audience that I was reaching was. And I had no idea what I was trying to say to them. If indeed I had anything to say to them. I was becoming a trained circus animal for the bourgeoisie. And when I realized that, I had an enormous crisis of conscience. And, you know, I like had kind of a breakdown. And I ended up realizing I had to move back to the States. And I ended up, you know, as Raymond Chandler said, um, they tipped the country and end and everything with the screw loose fell into California. And so I found myself falling into San Francisco, where I spent the next decade of my life slowly rebuilding my sense of myself and of my work. 
And the key components of it were realizing that I had to make a work whose ideas and whose politics and who the work was trying to reach in some way reflected my politics. What I'd been doing was a huge alienation from my own politics. And that I quickly discovered that meant that playwrights had to be at the center of my work, not exiled from my work, because a playwright was the only way to get that complexity of communication involved in a work. And so because it was the Bay Area, everything was accessible to me. And as I was rehabilitating myself, I signed on as, yes, an assistant director for production of Julius Caesar yeah. at the Berkeley Shakespeare Festival in 1978. I was 21 years old. I was Richard E.T. White's assistant. And it was the first time I'd assisted anybody. It was the first show that I hadn't done myself. It was the first time I'd worked on Shakespeare. I didn't know what a stage manager was to be sort of that rehearsal. I was such an you know, ignorant experimental theater guy. Um, and I fell in love. Uh, I fell in love with the play. I fell in love with the communication of the play. I fell in love with what it meant to direct this playwright that people have been producing and writing about for hundreds of years and how incredibly rich it was to start to enter into that dialogue and entering into a practice that existed long before I was born and was going to exist long after I was dead and where I could start as a novice and grow within it. Being part of that tradition was, you know, um, part of my rebirth. And I have been producing, directing, dramaturging, studying Shakespeare ever since 1978. Very cool. Um, mm -hmm. Emily, did we get any other questions? Uh, there do not seem to be any more audience questions. Why would anyone want to make me yeah. talk more? Um, I should say just, just a funny moment. That, that season at Berkeley Shakespeare Festival, I also got to watch um, this marvelous young actress play Juliet, and it was Annette Benning's first professional job coming out of the ACT Conservatory. And everybody knew that she was just lightning in a bottle from the moment she started performing. And it was such a joy, many, many years later, for, to have her come back to the Delacorte and play Regan in our production of King Lear in the summer of 2014. I do remember hearing stories about her when she was young and acting oh. at Star oh. over, I guess. Uh, you know, I should tell you the last uh, event we had for Shakespeare America was a panel discussion, some uh, African-American theater artists, and we, it was a great conversation. One of the things we got to just at the very end, the question about, well, you know, where do we go from here? In other words, you know, what are the main things we need to address? And actually, uh, your friend Diana Thompson was on the panel, and, and I think she was the one who spoke up and said, well, the one way in which all of us are failing, all of us who care about the theater, I'll care about Shakespeare, care about Shakespeare, is just when you look at the audience, it's 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 such a narrow demographic, you know. Right. You can afford the tickets, it's, it's almost exclusively white. It's uh, older people, you know, for the most part. Not there's anything wrong with older people. Um, I'm myself in that category. Um, and uh, I was just that was interesting then to, to sort of. Think about you as as the next uh, artist we wanted to talk to because of your that's been such an issue with you. Uh, I even I, think I read in an interview in, in, the, in the Times that you, you know, said so your goal was to make all theater free. Yeah. Uh, and, and is that is that ultimately the, the the way that we will in fact solve this problem that I identified that we have to the demographics we need young people we need people of color you know. <laughs> I'm I'm happy to say that um, we we Ayanna is now helping me to solve the problem because she is on staff at the public as one of our two Shakespeare scholars in residence in addition to Jim Shapiro and both of whom are just spectacularly useful. Um, but no, it's not it's not just about making it free. Free is important, but it has shifted uh, from being the most important thing for me, which I thought it would be when I arrived to being one of the important things, because I've realized that these other barriers um, to owning and appreciating and feeling yourself connected to Shakespeare are much harder to overcome than the economic one. And if you overcome the economic one, it doesn't mean you've overcome any of the other ones. So it's it's this process. And again, Ayana has been a fantastic help on that. It's how can we create the programs 
how can we reposition the role that Shakespeare and the role that theater has in the lives of our communities? And it's why the public works thing is so exciting because crossing the barrier and saying this distinction between professional and non-professional is actually not that interesting. It's not the most important distinction. And once you throw that out, and once you say that, no, what's important is how the act of making theater animates and connects a community, and it's not just a professional community, and it means people aren't either audience or artists, but people people who are playing all of those roles, there's where I think change really lies, and it's following that particular thread that I'm hoping to do in the very few years remaining to me. Thank you. Well, I would, it seems to be 2.30 exactly, so we were able to end right on time. I want to thank you enormously for agreeing to be here, for speaking so eloquently and sensitively and inspiringly on so many things. Uh, your your self-deprecations, uh, notwithstanding, you are a fascinating speaker I could listen to all day. <laughs> thank you, David. Well, this was really this was really fun. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to talk about this stuff. And you know, I think we also have to thank the pandemic. It became much easier for us to arrange this once it had to be Zoom. I mean, getting me to Southern Oregon was not being so easy up till then. But now, yeah. it must be admitted at this point that we've been trying for years. To- <laughs> <laughs> for years, and he wanted to. He wanted to, but he's a very mm-hmm. busy guy. We finally made it Yes. You don't know how good it felt to say yes to you, David. (laughs) Thank you. Okay. Thank you all all you out there. Thank you, Finley. Thank you, Finley. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thanks.